This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. Chapter 9 deals with financial performance measures, and much of this is going to be revision of financial ratios, which have met in previous papers. So here are the two of the groupings of uh, ratios. And what I have to say at the start is you have to look to see what the question says to see which ratios are going to address the specific issues which have been raised. So obviously if you're dealing with will the company continue trading, is it safe you'll be looking at liquidity and gearing. If you're looking at profitability, we have the profitability ratios and then we'll see on the next slide that we have got investor ratios as well. So the return on capital employed, what is the return on capital employed? Well, it is the uh, net profit. It's before interest and tax. So it's a profit uh, before interest and tax divided by the capital employed. And the capital employed is the share capital plus the reserves plus long-term loans. So it's a profit before interest and tax divided by the capital employed, share capital, reserves, any preference shares, if there are any of those, and long-term loans. Gross profit percentage is the gross profit or trading profit uh, divided by sales. Net profit percentage, sometimes called operating profit percentage, is the operating profit divided by the sales. And really what connects these two here is going to be expenses. And I often find it quite worthwhile to work out expenses over sales because if that ratio rises, it kind of implies that the companies are getting bigger, but they haven't kept the expenses in proportion that perhaps some of the uh, cost control isn't as good as it might be. Liquidity. Liquidity looks very much at whether or not the company is going to be able to pay its way and to pay its liabilities, really, as if full due. The current ratio, if you remember, is current assets over current liabilities. By and large, people like to see that a bit over one, although it does depend on the type of business that you're in. If you're renting lots of properties, then you're almost guaranteed to get most of that rent coming in. Uh, so you can plan your cash flows very well. You can live with quite a low uh, current ratio. If, however, your income is up and down all over the place, but of course your, your, a lot of your current liabilities, a lot of payments have to be made every month anyway, then you probably need a, a higher current uh, ratio to allow you to survive the, the tough months. The big question mark in the current uh, ratio is how quick will inventory be sold and then eventually turn into cash. And that's why it can be important to have a look at the quick or the asset test ratio. That's the current assets except inventory divided by the current liabilities. Again, if that's much below one, people probably get just a little bit worried there. Uh, the, Buying stock is essentially the act of a volunteer. No one can guarantee that lots of inventory is going to turn into lots of receivables and then into lots of cash. Receivables, collection period, payables uh, period and days of inventory are all good type of housekeeping uh, ratios to see how well they're managing the really the current assets of the business. The receivables period, if, if you remember... Uh, uh, what that is, the receivables period is going to be the receivables divided by the sales per day. How many days worth of sales are in receivables, in other words? The payables period is going to be the payables. Uh, and really what uh, causes uh, payables to increase is your purchases so how many days worth of purchases are represented in the payables balance and days of inventory 
Uh, it'll be the inventory. How long is it going to last? Well, you're using inventory through cost of sales, really. That consumes inventory. So ideally, it's going to be cost of sales per day. But if you can't get to cost of sales, then as an approximation, purchases per day will do. And in fact, it would be identical if the inventory stays level. Cost of sales and purchase will be the same if the inventory doesn't change. People tend to get a bit worried in general if receivables collection period goes up. Are they losing control of receivables? But of course, it might be a deliberate policy to give more credit, or they might have started selling more overseas, and just the transportation of goods overseas takes longer, and it's longer to collect those amounts due. Payables period increasing. You, you want to not pay too quickly, but if you begin paying too slowly, then your suppliers can get nervous. They may stop supplying or they may require cash up front. And days of inventory, again, if it increases a lot, you get a little bit worried. Have they made a purchasing error? Will they never be able to get rid of that inventory? Or it could be, again, a deliberate strategy. They're gearing up for a big sales push and we just happen to pick a ratio, pick a balance sheet value for inventory when the warehouse is particularly full, waiting for the next month's, as I say, sales, um, what they hope for is a sales bonanza. The next uh, set of uh, ratios, we've got gearing ratios. Gearing looks very much at the, the risk. High gearing implies high borrowing. It implies you have a high amount of interest to pay every year, whether or not the profits are going to be there. And the, the common ones, the, the, the gearing ratio, is either long-term borrowing over equity, or it can be uh, long-term borrowing over equity plus long-term borrowings. It doesn't matter which is used, as long as you are consistent from one year to the next. So basically, equity over debt, book values, or equity over equity plus debt, book values in all cases. Myself, I find interest cover particularly useful. Interest cover is the number of times you can pay interest. So basically, it's your operating profit. That's out of what you're going to pay the interest out of, divided by the interest. So if you're up around 10, you could pay the interest 10 times. No one is going to be very nervous about that. If you're down at about 1.5, it means all or nearly all of your operating profit is consumed by interest. The operating profit just has to fall a little bit or interest rates rise a little bit, and you could be going to be in some trouble beating these obligations. Remember, interest is a problem because it's a fixed cost, essentially. You have to pay it whether or not you make profits. But similarly, as uh, operating gearing here, it looks at fixed costs. Uh, various sorts of ways of looking at it uh, here. You can have fixed costs as a proportion of total costs. Or sometimes you might see fixed costs over variable costs. But it is a, a, a measure of how much of your, your costs, what proportion of your fixed costs, what proportion of your costs are going to be fixed. High operating gearing, so lots of fixed costs, maybe rent of a factory, rent of shops, uh, lots of employees on fixed salaries, uh, lots of machines being leased, so you have to pay those costs even if they're idle. High operating costs, uh, high fixed costs means your operating gearing is quite high and if your profit falls just a little bit it could be very hard for you to pay the rent, the leases and the salaries. Investor measures, price earnings ratio, that's price per share. Over the earnings per share. So price per share divided by the earnings per share. The only way you can really judge this is by looking at similar companies. And this is something which really only works with listed companies. But if our company had a PE ratio of, let's say, 12, and the industry 
had, say, a P-E ratio of 9, we have to think, why are investors pricing our company quite highly? In the industry, the share price is 9 times the earnings, but for us, the price is 12 times the earnings, or 12 times the historical earnings. And this situation would mean that really some sort of growth is expected. Last time's earnings were a little bit poor, but we're willing to pay a high price for this particular company because we expect next year's earnings to be much higher and for the P-E ratio is then to be brought back to be more normal. Similarly, a P-E ratio which is below the industry average tends to imply that people expect a rather poorer future, that next year's earnings and so on are going to be depressed a little bit and that's why the P-E ratio has been brought down. Earnings per share is a useful one. Uh, looking at dividends or dividend yield uh, here is a little bit arbitrary. It depends on the dividends that have been declared. And this is the basically the dividend per share over the share price. But the directors can move the dividends up and down. They can manipulate this some sometimes. So even if profits fall a little bit, directors can keep the dividends up or even increase them to keep the P, uh, the dividend yield high. But there's no fiddling around with earnings per share. It is the earnings available to the ordinary shareholders divided by the number of shares. And you want really to see that a nice steady increase. It means that per share the company is producing more profit whether that whether or not that is actually uh, distributed in dividend is is another matter i think we have covered expenses of sales we don't need to do that one uh, in there again remember the key to all ratio analysis is really comparison comparing to previous years of the same company sometimes comparing to similar companies sometimes comparing to industry averages. Here's the example from chapter 10. And what you're asked to do is to decide whether or not these figures, four years worth of figures, support the contention that the company has managed to increase shareholder wealth. So shareholder wealth we're looking at, which will mean uh, that uh, ratios such as Receivables collection period, current ratios, even gearing perhaps, aren't going to be directly relevant to that. We're going to be much more interested in the things that shareholders maybe really care about, which could be share price, could be earnings per share, could be dividends, could be the profit made by the company uh, overall. We have to be a little bit careful there because as we go through uh, this line here, when we look at the, the number of shares in issue here, it's gone from 9, 9 up to 12, 12. So, and it says that there's been a rights issue sometime in year 3. Uh, and obviously if you issued shares to kind of double the capital of the company, you would really expect uh, profits to increase in a, a similar sort of proportion. So when we when we talk about have they increased the uh, wealth of shareholders. I think we're talking about a, you know, a given shareholder or a shareholder with a set number of shares uh, in there. Uh, because obviously if you subscribe to a rights issue, you're putting more money into the company and you're a bit disappointed if the the value of your shares had therefore uh, risen. So what should we look at? Well, let's look uh, first of all at turnover. Turnover has increased very substantially there. A very large increase in turnover seems really quite 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 good. We could work out the uh, percentage increase in turnover. Of course, this itself doesn't mean anything. Uh, we have to look at, at other things as well. But f uh, 59,000 minus 43.8 divided by 43.8. Uh, it looks like about a 35% increase in turnover uh, over the really the one to the you know the the, 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 the three periods the four the four years so that's uh, pretty good 
Uh, what about the, uh, we could work out gross profit percentage. Well, why not do that if we have time in there? So the gross profit percentage is, uh, the gross profit is going to be uh, the difference in there. So it's 43.8 minus 16.6. 27.2 and if we divide that by, divided by 43.8 it's looking at about 62% as a gross profit percentage and over here we're making a gross profit of 59 minus 22.9 36.1 nice increase uh, divided by 59 it's going to be a 61% gross profit percentage. So we've gone from uh, 62 to 61. It's about stood still, really, which which is which is perhaps okay. What about the net profits? How have they increased? Here we have uh, eight seven. Here we have eleven three. So eleven point three minus eight point seven divided by 8.7 shows we have there about a 30% increase in net profit percentage. A little bit disappointing. Uh, our sales have increased 35%, but our profits, our net profits, have only gone up 30%. Uh, it implies we're maybe losing ground a little bit in terms of holding on to, you know, control of expenses. We look at the uh, profit after interest and tax, uh, 51 up to 755, so 7.55 minus 5.1 divided by 5.1. Uh, it's a 48% increase in, in, in there. And the main reason for that very large increase is, of course, that the interest has fallen away. Uh, we have issued shares and presumably this has taken the place of we finance some loan capital uh, and it's very good indeed to see that the uh, profit after interest and tax has increased massively this is the profit that's going to be available uh, to the shareholders uh, and once we're there we can actually work out the earnings per share there so the earnings per share here it's going to be 87 rate Point seven, if I do it in thousands, divided by the number of shares divided by uh, in there, it's going to be uh, going to be nine. So the number of shares in issue is going to be nine thousand. The a big one. We can't work out the earnings per share there. It has been, it's down here, of course. It's a profits after in tax, the interest in tax. It's five one and naught naught over nine thousand. So 5,100, about 9,000, is going to be uh, 0 0.57. What do we get on earnings per share out here? Uh, well, earnings per share out here is going to be uh, the profit after is going to be 7550 divided by now there's 12,000 shares in issue. And that's why it's important to look at earnings per share, not just profits growth. Uh, any fool can make profits grow if you simply you know, get more capital coming in. So 7550 divided by 12,000 is going to be about 63. That's very good. Earnings per share increased from 57 to 63. That really is increasing or should be increasing the wealth of the shareholders. We can use this to work out the share price. So here we have a PE ratio. So the PE ratio, we take again this one here for this company, which is Rep say 17, equals the price per share 
over the earnings per share 0.57 okay so the price is going to be 17 times 0.57 it's going to be about 9.69 Over here, the same idea, we have the earnings per share of 63, or 0.63 here, and the price here is going to be uh, the P-E ratio, which is now 19, times 0.63. So the price per share there, 19 times 0.63, is going to be, ooh, 11.97. So roughly speaking, gone from about 9.7 to about 12 uh, over the basically the three the three year periods in here, one, two, three, and that's that's quite a nice little little kind of an increase. So roughly speaking, it's going to be 12 minus 9.7, uh, and if we divide that, so that that is um, divided by uh, 9.69. That's about a 23, 24% increase. We seem to be increasing share price at around 7, 8% per annum. We need to find out what inflation is, of course, to see whether or not that was keeping up with it. But things are looking good so far. And we see here that the PE ratio started off below industry average, and now it's above industry average. So this is implying that there are even more good things to be coming in the future. All told, I would say that the company has managed to increase shareholder wealth. It has done good things for its shareholders. Uh, we've seen that the earnings per share has increased. We've seen the profit, uh, uh, the net profit percentage has increased very substantially uh, there to 48% uh, 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 percent in, in here. Or forty-eight percent increase, uh, rather, from here to here. The earnings per share, as I said, have increased uh, very nicely indeed, from five seven to six three. The share price has increased from about nine point seven to eleven point nine seven. The uh, P/E ratio is looking very optimistic. So I would conclude that by and large, the company's done really quite well.